Seneca wrote, Once we have driven away all things that disturb or frighten us, there follows unbroken tranquility and unending freedom. For when pleasures and pains have been banished, a boundless joy comes in to replace all that is trivial, fragile, and harmful, a joy that is unshaken and unwavering. Then follow peace and harmony of the mind, and true greatness, coupled with gentleness, since ferocity is always born from weakness. On the Happy Life, 3.4. That is the last Stoic text David Feidler quotes in his newly published book, Breakfast with Seneca. David then concludes by writing, In my view, this passage is Seneca's most detailed and compelling description of the final goal of Stoic training. I'm happy to have David Feidler with me today on the podcast to discuss his new book, and I guess you can say that we are beginning with the end in mind. David, will you please introduce yourself? Well, hi, Chris. It's really uh, good to speak with you, and uh, I've really enjoyed listening to your various podcasts over the years. Um, My name is David Feidler, and uh, I study ancient philosophy. I've been studying Stoicism uh, pretty seriously for around 15 years now. And uh, how did I get interested in Stoicism? Well, back when I was uh, in school, uh, in my early 20s, I studied ancient Greek philosophy and ancient religions, and uh, I studied all sorts of different philosophies. I did read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. I did have some exposure to uh, Stoicism, but uh, I really didn't become interested in Seneca specifically Uh, until about 14 years ago, and I've been reading Seneca ever since then. Okay, was there a reason why you picked Seneca for this book? Uh, Well, there there was. It's because I started reading Seneca. I was introduced to Seneca, and I just found him to be a compelling writer. And I developed this little ritual of uh, reading Seneca every day, and I, I developed into a ritual of reading him at breakfast, which is where the title of the book, uh, Breakfast with Seneca, mm. comes from. Interesting. And uh, I just found that I felt a kind of kinship with Seneca because he uh, actually seemed to know what he was talking about. And uh, I have a PhD in philosophy, and most philosophers are very hyper-specialized, and they never really address uh, human issues in their work, or not very often. Usually it's something that's very abstract and theoretical. And so the way that Seneca spoke directly about human issues was very attractive to me. Well, since you mentioned uh, Um, professional philosophers, what what is the target audience of your book? It doesn't appear from reading it that it was professional academic philosophers. Did you have a a particular target audience in mind? Right. <clears throat> it's written for a general audience, but it's a uh, work that's uh, deeply rooted in scholarly research, mm-hmm. as you can see from like the endnotes and the bibliography. But um, I think that anyone with an interest in Seneca or Stoicism would get something out of the book, even someone who is uh, very familiar with Seneca's writings. Yeah, I agree. I think and, uh, when, as from reading the book, I learned a few things about Seneca that I had not come across before. So you've obviously done your research on him. Yeah. The other reason I wanted to write it is because there is really no clear guide to Seneca's ideas. No one has written a book like that. And I think that the main reason for that is that Seneca was such a, you know, voluminous writer. His And he's very consistent in his ideas, but they're spread out over hundreds and hundreds of pages. And the sheer work of doing the research to pull all of that material together, I think most people would find that to be daunting. In fact, I found it to be daunting, but I actually did it. So, <laughs> What was the most interesting thing that you learned about Seneca doing your research? Uh, well, actually, uh, there were a few things. Um, one thing is that I learned that Seneca was seemingly the first writer or one of the first writers to discuss how we're unconsciously influenced by other people Hmm. and how that can have an impact on our character. Um, Another thing that I learned, which was uh, kind of interesting, that no one seems to have noticed is that he uses this repeating metaphor throughout his writings that someone should have a real destination when traveling and just not wander around aimlessly. And he uses that as a metaphor for Stoicism 
as a philosophical path. He, he uh, describes that in different ways, but it's essentially the same idea. And it was rather exciting to uh, discover that. An another thing that I discovered too, which I was a little surprised by, is how close Seneca's thinking was to that of uh, Epictetus, especially on the dichotomy of control mm -hmm. and on the topic of freedom as well. And uh, you do find the dichotomy of control, that idea, or what modern Stoics call the dichotomy of control in Seneca. But um, the way that Seneca describes it is he describes it as uh, fortune, which would not be up to us, and then basically virtue, which is anything to do with our um, inner thought or character, which we which is up to us. Okay. So the other thing that um, I discovered when writing this book is that it really clarified my understanding about what the Stoics meant by the idea of God, <clears throat> which I think is very confusing to modern people because yes. uh, all the Greek philosophers, including the Stoics, didn't think of God as being some kind of person or creator that exists outside of the universe. And that's why many people say like you and uh, Kai Whiting and Massimo Pellucci refer to the Stoic God. Uh, which is a term I don't really like, but the reason people obviously use the term Stoic God is because the Stoic idea doesn't correspond to what most people would think of as God these days. And uh, when I was working on the book, my, my thinking about this became a bit clarified because um, I've heard many people in the Stoic world some of whom are friends of mine refer to the Stoics as being theists. And hmm. I believe that's a mistake, actually, because at least by the modern definition of theism, because they were pantheists and they thought that nature or the universe as a whole is God and that God doesn't stand outside of the universe. Um, but what I discovered in some of the reading is that uh, pantheism is really different from both theism and atheism. It's kind of like a, a midpoint or a golden mean between those two extremes. And uh, I do find atheism and theism to be somewhat extreme views. So I found it interesting that pantheism is an alternative to both of those. And um, I personally think it's a more useful and accurate metaphor for describing the universe. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I've I've argued uh, the the metaphor that I use is uh, you know you've got atheism on one side and theism on the other side, and and stoicism really is in the using the World War One metaphor in the no man's land in between, which means unfortunately yes. you take shots from both sides, and <laughs> right. you know, um, but yeah, it is it is in that uh, who is it uh, I forget who who talks about the open space, but it's in that that open space right. between theism yeah. and atheism. And, and I think I have a couple of questions that will dive into that. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask real quick was some people are pretty critical, and even Stoics are pretty critical of Seneca uh, based upon some of his financial dealings, his relationship with Nero. And I'm curious, having spent so many breakfasts with Seneca and so much time studying him, what you think of him as uh, an actual practicing Stoic you know, with some of that criticism in mind. Right. Well, I always try to take an evidence-based approach. And um, I think there's uh, no question that Seneca did have some regret about working uh, for Nero. There are a couple of quotes in the book where I think Seneca refers to this as quite obvious. Um, but I also think that there are some stories that have come down to us about Seneca and Nero that are quite unreliable, certainly by modern historical standards. They wouldn't stand up to scrutiny. Some of these stories read like the, you know they've been written for comic strips <laughs> or something. But uh, there is no question that Seneca experienced some moral harm, uh, you know, by associating with Nero as anyone would. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that would have been true, actually, with all the Roman emperors of the time who were, you know, constantly engaged in things like political assassinations. And, um, you know, one of these stories, which sounds credible, is that, you know, Caligula wanted to have Seneca killed because he was jealous of a speech that Seneca gave and someone talked him out of it. And then Claudius had Seneca exiled to the island of Corsica on trumped up charges and then Nero ended up killing his brother, his mother, his wife, and finally Seneca and many other people. 
So to work for any of those emperors would put anyone in a very dangerous uh, situation. So all in all, all in all, I think that Seneca was actually a good Stoic given the circumstances he was up against. He did uh, follow the uh, Stoic injunction to participate in political life, which uh, none of the earlier Greek Stoics did. They spoke about it, but they didn't do it themselves. And I do think that Seneca wanted Nero to uh, be a virtuous person. He was Nero's uh, tutor from age 11, and Nero became emperor at age 16. But obviously, at a certain point, it became obvious that Nero was a hopeless case. Yeah. And I think Seneca, you know, he wrote that he saw himself as being an imperfect person. He wasn't a Stoic sage or anything like that. And he said that uh, he would be happy if he could just make a bit of moral progress each day, which I think actually is the Stoic ideal. So based on the evidence, you know, that, that I'm seeing, I think Seneca did live up to, uh, you know, the Stoic ideal. He, he tried to uh, reduce his faults and morally improve his life each day. Yeah, no, I, I agree with your character of him. I think that, and as I pointed out in a recent uh, post, I think we need to keep in mind that he was associated with very powerful political figures and what that entails. And we just need to look at our own political times and how people are, exactly. you know, <laughs> people are lamb out. <clears throat> Many untruths are said about people that can be recorded in history about political figures. And it seems to me that that was the case with Seneca. Um, you referred to the uh, voluminous writings of Seneca and how difficult it is to read all of them and get them into the book. One of the things that I noticed was that you uh, made several references to Seneca's book, Natural Questions, which is, in my opinion, probably the most overlooked writing of his in modern times, at least. And so I was, I was happy to see that. What do you think, uh, in terms of natural questions, do you think that that's an important book for moderns to read? Uh, yes. Um, I think Natural Questions is one of Seneca's more complex works. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote that right at the end of his life, along with the letters to Lucilius. Uh, it's one of his more complex works, like say, like On Benefits, you know, which is rather uh, daunting to get through. But so if someone wants to read all of Seneca's works, I would say those two works until last. But those works do include some very interesting discussions about the Stoic view of God and nature and nature's generosity and things like that. So they're, they're very valuable works for a number of reasons. Okay. Let's dive into the I wouldn't start with them, though. No, no, no. <laughs> I are, agree. Well, and, and, well. and there are parts of it that, you know, dealing with meteorology and stuff that people are just going to find, you know, maybe not as useful as, as uh, they were in ancient times. But uh, I... I would agree. It's certainly not the first thing you want to tackle, and it's probably one of the last, if not the last, writings of Seneca that you want to tackle. But uh, let's dive into the book. And uh, chapter one of your book is titled The Lost Art of Friendship. And you open with a background story of Seneca's letters to, now I I pronounce it Lucilius. You said Lucilius. Is, is there a correct pronunciation for that? Am I mispronouncing it? Uh, uh, well, the C in uh, Latin is supposedly hard, hard like a K, okay. so it would be Lucilius, Lucilius in the same way that Seneca, the C in Seneca is hard. Interesting. Okay. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that anyone knows how ancient Latin was pronounced for sure. It creates other problems too, because like we say Cicero, so the alternative would be like Cicero or something like that. <laughs> All right. So it doesn't, well, if I say I Lucilius, you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> But uh, that's fine. Uh, I'm I'm interested. Uh, please share that what you refer to as a uh, oftentimes overlooked background story of these letters. Okay. Um, well, one one thing I would say first is that. Uh, if someone starts reading Seneca, they might easily overlook the fact that every single one of his philosophical writings was actually written to a friend of his or a family member, mm -hmm. because he thought that philosophy should involve person-to-person -person relationships. And uh, Lucilius was a friend of Seneca's. He was some kind of uh, government official in Sicily. And uh, he might have actually been the local governor there, uh, but Seneca dedicated his last writings uh, to Lucilius in his life, the most 
famous of which is Seneca's letters. And if you do a careful reading of the letters, you'll see that Lucilius saw Seneca as uh, being a philosophical mentor. And one of the reasons that Lucilius was in touch with Seneca is that he was experiencing what we might now call a loss of meaning in his life. He had achieved a position of uh, fame, fortune, and status, but he wanted to step back from public life and live in a more meaningful way. And he also had a lot of uh, very neurotic concerns about not being able to afford retirement, which is something that Seneca discusses in his letters. So this is actually uh, part of the narrative of the letters that you know gets carried on over the course of you know several letters because uh, Seneca is trying to get Lucilius to examine his beliefs about money and retirement and what's important in life. But that's basically how it seems to start out. He's, he's looking forward to, he's, he's looking for a way to lead a more meaningful life. So he's turning to Seneca as a philosophical mentor. Okay. You mentioned that uh, he was writ, he wrote all of his uh, works to friends. Does, in your opinion, does Seneca treat friendship maybe differently than some of the other Stoic, at least the writings that we have? Is he, does he put more emphasis on that than the other Stoics? Uh, well, he does, um, at least in terms of the writings that have come down to mm -hmm. us. And for Seneca, having friends and uh, intellectual companions, it was something uh, very essential for being able to make progress in philosophy, especially Stoicism, which involves developing your character. And uh, he believed that we need friends, guides, and mentors to do that, including guides and mentors uh, from the past. Um, but it was also important to other ancient philosophers. For example, uh, Aristotle devoted one-fifth of his ethics to friendship. And you can see Seneca drawing on some of those ideas there. But he thought that um, having a person-to-person -person relationship when you're studying philosophy was very important. Okay. Chapter two of your book is titled, uh, Value Your Time, Don't Postpone Living. And in my reading of Seneca, this seems to be one of his, uh, what do we say, one of his principal themes in, in his writings. Uh, what do you think Seneca can offer 21st century people on this, what I would call a perennial quandary? Uh, well, basically, one of the points that I make in the book is that nothing has really changed psychologically mm -hmm. between Seneca's time and our own. So the, all the things that he writes about are basically contemporary. He felt that time uh, is our most valuable asset and that many people don't use it wisely. And <clears throat> he was especially critical of people who engage in constant business, busyness. They're like always running around constantly, but they don't really accomplish anything of uh, significance while their lives slip away. And he's also critical of people who constantly plan for the future, but don't live in or enjoy the present moment because the future may never come, so it's important, for, you know, to live our lives now and not postpone uh, living for a future that might not ever arrive. And I think, if you were to put it in modern terms, one of the things Seneca is saying is that we should uh, work in order to live, but not live in order to work. And mm -hmm. how everyone will find, you know, the right kind of balance in their own lives regarding that will vary greatly because everyone's in a different situation. But it is something that. Seneca thought people should really think about. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe you can make an argument. Uh, one can make an argument today that it's it's easier to uh, be distracted and busy and uh, lose sight of what's important today, although I'm sure it wasn't uh, that much. I guess we just have more distractions, especially at our fingertips with smart devices and so forth. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Chapter three is titled, right. um, How to Overcome... Uh, worry and anxiety. And you wrote, one of the most effective ways to reduce worry is simply to monitor your inner judgments and emotions they, uh, and the emotions that they give rise to as the process happens. And as you start to feel anxious about future events, the Stoic philosophers, Epictetus, called this practice prosike, mindfulness or attention. Now, this is, in my mind, one of the more important topics of Stoicism and one that is I think sometimes overlooked. I wrote a paper on it in 2013 titled Prosake. And I'm wondering um, how you describe the Stoic concept of Prosake and then how 
if if and how you see it differing from the Buddhist concept of mindfulness, since you've used the word mindfulness in this quote. Right. Well, uh, prosake does literally translate to mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you can translate it as attention. Uh, I was in Athens once, and I saw a sign that said prosake on it, and it's like attention. Ah. So uh, they're still using this term, and it means paying attention to your thoughts or being mindful of the judgments uh, that you're forming in relationship to impressions. So part of um, the Stoic philosophy of Epictetus is that, and this goes back to the original Greek Stoics, is that we're always being... um, bombarded with these impressions and then we apply judgments to them and part of the stoic theory of emotion is that uh negative extremely negative violent emotions arise because people are making uh incorrect uh judgments relating to impressions so it's that old saying of uh, epictetus it's not things in themselves that upset us, but our judgments or opinions about things. And so prosoke is just that process of being mindful of um, the process as it's unfolding in real time. And one of the ways to avoid anxiety is that if you ever start worrying about something or feeling anxious, to immediately like look at what's going on in your mind and see what kind of uh, judgments are you know, being formed and contributing to those kinds of emotional reactions. Now, um, does it differ from the Buddhist concept of mindfulness? Probably. I don't know enough about Buddhism, actually, uh, to to answer that. But based on what I've read, I think it's it's a bit different. You know, it's it's uniquely stoic in a sense. On the other hand, I think you know, obviously, mindfulness is a universal concept in some way. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that Seneca stressed as well is the fact that we should always be um, attuned to the fact that we're living in the present moment because anxiety arises when the mind rushes ahead and starts worrying about things that haven't even occurred yet. And the best thing is to be aware of that process happening and then call yourself back to the present moment. So. A lot of people who talk about uh, mindfulness these days also talk about that, I believe. I haven't really looked into mm-hmm. it, but that's the case for Seneca. Okay. And you've mentioned the Stoic theory of, uh, I, I don't want to say controlling emotions because I think that's the wrong way to address it, mm-hmm. but of, uh, of I guess, stepping in and, and preventing the emotions from occurring in the, in the first place. And so chapter four, you're dealing with one of those big ones, anger. And Seneca, again, this is a topic that he spent, I think, a lot of time on. Mm-hmm. And at, from your research, what does what is Seneca's position on anger? Because I think it differs from even some people who uh, practice Stoicism. Uh-huh. Well, um, on anger, it's not just an essay by Seneca. It's actually a book. Mm-hmm. He wrote an entire book on it. It's really amazing. And it's very important, too, because it's the uh, most comprehensive surviving work on Stoic psychology and how emotions uh, come into being. And his thought about anger is that it was the worst possible emotion because it's more powerful than any other emotion. And it can just basically like topple the self. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it just takes over the personality and then anger is control in control he referred to it as a temporary form of insanity and has all these really uh wonderful graphic descriptions of what angry people are like uh and uh one of the things that's interesting is that if you look at the website of the american psychological association basically 90 percent of what they have to say about anger management corresponds to what seneca said in that Hmm, book interesting yeah, I, I think sometimes I watch the news and I watch the the angry protests and people, you know, destroying property and in some cases getting violent towards other human beings. And I think you know, someone needs to go hand them a copy of Seneca's anger on anger. <laughs> You'd probably get beaten right. down trying to do it, but but yeah, clearly we 
there are there is a sense in modern times of and I've seen it bleed over into some discussions of stoicism, which I think is entirely wrong, that there's a there's a concept of righteous anger. And I as you point out, the problem with anger is that it can't be controlled, you know, and and, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Seneca's theory. It, once you once you open that that bottle, once that genie's out of the bottle, it can't be put back in. Or t well, it takes time, you know, and it, it's not something that that you can intellectually say, okay, well, I'm going to stop being angry. You know, my my opinion is most people, when you see when they get into a state of anger, it literally just takes. It has to run itself out. It takes time for it to, to burn itself right. out. Yeah, it's it's important to note too that when Seneca talks about anger, he's actually speaking about what we would call rage, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so um, it's quite permissible if you're a stoic to become a bit miffed about things sure. every now and then, because as long as it doesn't have the judgment attached to it that turns it into like a violent emotion that overpowers your psyche. There's nothing wrong with, with being miffed. So that's perfectly acceptable. But one of the uh, points that Seneca made is that there are a lot of people who believe today that you have to become totally irate and outraged in order to create social change. And Seneca did not agree with that at all. The, the way that he described it is that Anger doesn't help us in any way in terms of really making the world a better place. It just makes the world a worse place. And he said, one thing that you could think of is the uh, psychological state of a judge, you know, like in a court. And if a judge was making his judgments based on anger, it would be a disaster. Instead, sometimes the judge will have to punish people but he's not doing that out of anger. He's doing that so that people will become better in the future. And so that's why Seneca was really opposed to this idea that um, we should engage in anger or even violence to change society because it's perfectly possible to do it through rational means instead. Yeah, and I think in modern times, well, yeah, semi-modern times, we can see you know, if we juxtapose uh, the what we would call the anger or dissatisfaction of someone like a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King who wanted to bring about social change with uh, today in America Antifa, you know, who is just you know, right. argue, uh, screaming, yelling, throwing rocks, burning stuff down. That to me would uh, Seneca would look at that and say, yeah, that's insanity. You know, that's insanity, which where right. he would have he would have completely condoned, you know, what we might call the. Uh, the upset of a Martin Luther King or a Gandhi because they were trying to seek a, a just end and were doing it through peaceful and rational means. Right, right. Yeah, because if you're engaging in anger, public anger, outrage, violence, it's just inflaming the situation and driving people apart. And to uh, generate social change, you have to bring people together. Now, in Chapter 5, uh, You've titled this interestingly, and I like this, wherever you go, there you are. You can't escape yourself. And uh, I think a, a play on a, another famous book, which is which is good, on, on page 84. I think you already referenced this, but uh, page 84, you provide a an interesting chart. And right. this is the, the two paths that you were talking about. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, I have that. I have that here. And uh, so... Actually, uh, since I wrote the book, I came up with a name for this. I call this the Stoic Mirror hmm. because uh, it's kind of like these different dichotomies and you can look at it and you could, all of these descriptions basically are from Seneca because he will uh, explicitly describe how uh, a, a Stoic is different from a non-Stoic or imply it strongly so you can figure, figure this out. But for example, a student of Stoicism is traveling with a destination, and a typical non-Stoic is wandering without a path. And then he's using these other metaphors, which are really the same, actually. A student of Stoicism is focused and consistent. A typical non-Stoic lacks focus and consistency. I mean, he, he writes about all of this. A student of Stoicism has a guiding purpose. A typical non-Stoic is blown in different directions by the winds of chance. And it, it goes you know, through these, these different dichotomies. A student of Stoicism is grateful to the universe. 
A typical non-steroid complains frequently. He has, uh, there's an entire chapter in the book about c complaints. And uh, the last one is that a student of Stoicism is traveling on the way to freedom and tranquility of mind by learning how to make sound mental judgments. And a typical non-Stoic uh, is enslaved by false opinions, which result in negative emotions and suffering, which you, we can see around ourselves every day. So I just thought that was very interesting because when I s started to see that he was using these different metaphors, I saw that you could actually make a chart out of them. And I think the chart is interesting because uh, you can basically look at it and see where you would fall on it, uh, you know, maybe like on any particular day. And yes. I think it's a, it's a good way to measure, um, you know, if you're making any progress in stoicism. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think the chart's great. And I think for that purpose is that you can, you can look at it and, and see it in many cases in a uh, you know, end of the day, kind of a meditation, where did I, where did I fall off the path here uh, today? And and uh, and right. have some self correcting um, insights. Chapter six um, deals with taming adversity, and you wrote, in other words, the Stoics learned how to see the world in a slightly different way than the average person, making hardships feel less painful. I would say, very true, and indeed they did view the world differently, which made their view of adversity, in fact, to a large degree, counterintuitive in many ways to what moderns would think. Um, I mean, this example when you know, Epictetus teaches us that we should not wish for things to happen the way we want them to, but that we should wish for things to happen the way they do. And when people read a passage like that, which I believe is in Chiridion 8, um, he, they think, well, I'm supposed to wish for the death of my loved one, or I'm supposed to wish for tragedy. And that's not what Epictetus is saying. He's not saying to wish for it in advance. He's saying that when these things happen, we wish that they happen because they happened in a rational universe. Not in, we're not wishing for right. horrible things to occur in, in in advance. We're saying, okay, now that this has happened, it happened, and there's a purpose. Um, right. I believe that a person has to adopt an entirely different worldview to see adversity through that stoic lens. What are your thoughts? Right. I really. Um I brought up that idea from Epictetus in the next chapter, actually, which is on uh, why you should never complain, mm -hmm. because that goes along very well with the idea you shouldn't complain about things. If you have something of a greater magnitude happen, like the death of a loved one, then it's, it's a little harder to apply that. But uh, what I did say in the chapter on face, facing adversity is that there, there are two basic Stoic ideas. One is that um, virtue is the only true, true good. Uh, and the other one is that some things are up to us and other things are not up to us. And if you bring those two ideas together and you actually uh, believe them or give them credence, you can see how that would really change a Stoic's uh, worldview because they wouldn't take adversity as serious seriously as another person might because they realize that virtue is the only true good and some things are not in our control. So, so that alone really um, results in a different worldview, I think, that separates someone on the path of stoicism from someone else. And it actually makes it much easier to f face adversities when they arise because the other thing is that the Stoics believed, you can find this in all of the Roman Stoics, the three main Roman Stoics, they all believe that whenever we're faced with adversity, that there's always an opportunity to turn it into something better mm -hmm. or something yeah. good through the exercise yeah. of virtue. And I find that to be very inspiring because uh, no matter what happens to you, even if it is something very terrible like the death of a, a loved one, the way that you respond to it or say there's a traffic accident and someone you know is is you know very badly injured. The way that you respond to that can be a, w a way to display virtue and take something that's negative and turn it into something that's good through your display of virtue. Yes, yeah, and and I think that is what the Stoic 
uh, conception of a rational and and you know providentially ordered cosmos does for people is it gives them the opportunity to see things from a different perspective and not be uh, destroyed by what we would otherwise interpret as tragedies in our lives. So since you brought up the next chapter, let's move on to that. Um, and it is titled, Why You Should Never Complain. And beginning on one o- page 107, uh, you make what should be an obvious point to anyone who's interested in Stoicism, and that is that uh, to follow nature, one must understand nature. You wrote, for the Stoics, mm-hmm. to follow nature, we need to understand nature, both human nature and the cosmos as a whole. And as they pointed out, we can fully understand ourselves. We can't fully understand ourselves without understanding the greater universe first. Uh, For the Stoics, the world is permeated by logos, which can be translated as rationality, intelligence, Mm -hmm. and by many other terms. Uh, Two paragraphs later, you argue that there is nothing unscientific about the fundamental Stoic belief in logos, and there's nothing irrational about Stoic belief in fate either. And then on the next page, you tackle uh, the topics of logos, fate, and uh, providence. Now, I, as you know from, if you've listened to my podcast at all, you know that I <laughs> certainly uh, agree that there's nothing unscientific about the Stoic conception of logos, fate, and providence. However, uh, it differs, those concepts differ quite dramatically from what I call the reductionist, materialist, mechanistic concept. Uh, account of nature that most uh, modern even scientists still hold that I think that paradigm is changing but that's still the concept that has a grasp on modern science and and in fact there are a couple of uh, modern stoic authors that are pretty popular that have outright declared that stoic physics is you know untenable in modern times so I'm curious why you think there is do you have an opinion about why there's such a huge disconnect in the Stoic community between, and I'll just put it out there, between atheists? There are there are many people who come to Stoicism as atheists and agnostics and really want to turn Stoicism into something that's agnostic or atheist. And mm-hmm. where any any thoughts on that? Right. Well. Um I think the the reason that some people struggle with those concepts is because they don't really understand them. Mm -hmm. For example, logos just means rationality, and it can mean intelligence. There are a lot of ways you could interpret that. It could be biological intelligence, which we can see when we look at living organisms in the biosphere. But then there's also other types of uh, rationality in nature that scientists have accepted you know for hundreds of years for example like kepler's three laws of uh, planetary motion so there's no problem with that scientifically i had this discussion with massimo uh, pellucci and he agreed with me he said there's no problem with logos and then uh, also fate because fate just means cause and effect and determinism there's no problem with that scientifically it, that's basically what the entire uh, scientific worldview was in the time of Newton, cause, effect, and determinism. And uh, scientists still generally believe in those principles. Whether there's something beyond determinism is, you know, being considered now, that's quite possible as well. The thing that really throws people, I think, is providence. Mm -hmm. Because it has this... uh, incredible Christian overtone and the idea that people think of when they hear the word providence is that there's a God out there who's made a special plan for every soul or every person and that when something happens to you, uh, you know, it's supposedly happening in some kind of good way or things like that. I'm not sure that that's actually the correct interpretation of providence. I believe my theory, uh, the Greek word is pronoia, mm-hmm. so it means like pre, uh, pre-knowledge. Mm-hmm. And my belief is that it refers to biological intelligence, because when you look at living organisms, if you like cut your hand, your hand knows how to heal itself. Or if you cut off the head of a flatworm, it knows how to grow a new head. So I think it's more based on biological intelligence. And I think you can find some uh, references to that actually in uh, 
Epictetus. I'd have to go back and check. But um, certainly, if you look at Providence in that way, there's something controversial about it. But then uh, the real zinger that the Stoics throw out is that they say all of these terms are, they mean just the identical thing. Logos, nature, fate, providence. So it's kind of like, how do you wrap your head around this? I think they're just saying that there's some kind of rationality in nature. And uh, we could look out and see a forest growing and say that, you know, this is some kind of providential manifestation because it just didn't happen purely by chance. Uh, even, up until recently, people, even scientists, believed in the laws of nature. Right. <laughs> so, and those laws were seen as uh, being rational in some way because we can understand them. I mean, it's an amazing phenomenon. It's, this, this is one of the most important questions in philosophy is that how is it that we can understand the order of nature? Well, the Stoics, I think, had the answer because we're an outgrowth of nature itself. We're part of nature. There's a rational order in nature. And because of that, because we're part of it in some mysterious way, we're able to comprehend it, for example, like through mathematics. When you actually look at like Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, it's just mind blowing how simple and elegant and rational the, the, the movement of the planetary bodies is. Right. It just took like, you know, centuries for people to finally uh, get rid of the noise and discover the actual, you know, laws behind the movements of the planets. Yeah. And I think you're, you're hitting on the right uh, metaphor with organisms because it, I, I, as I've said, you know, what's interesting is when the Stoics talk about their holistic, philosophical system, they use, you know, three uh, metaphors, right? They use the egg, they use an orchard, and they use an animal. And, and it, right, we, right. we sometimes think, well, what didn't they use? They didn't use a cart. Mm -hmm. They didn't use a building. They didn't use a bridge. They didn't use any artifact. They used organisms. And in any organism, if you remove one part, the organism dies. And so, yes, it. Uh, I think it, it is. It is true to. Or I think it's very accurate to present uh, providence as an organism, because again, the Stoics said that the cosmos is an organism. Uh, I think where people get hung up, and where some moderns get hung up, is then on the idea that that rationality that exists in the cosmos preceded human rationality; that it was already there; that it's an integral part of the cosmos, and. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, the modern science teaches us what? That our consciousness is the result of chance um, and is a byproduct of the mechanism, that it's, you know, it's an epiphenomenon or whatever. I think, uh, you know, Haydo said correctly that all of the, the fundamental dogmas of Stoicism derive from the idea that rationality had to preexist human rationality. And that's a that's a, a basic idea of of stoicism. And yeah, people get hung up on the word providence. And you're right for the for religious reasons. Um, but again, I personally I don't I don't think you can separate the concept of providence from the concept of something divine that preexists us, which is why the Stoics referred to it as God. It's not just logos, nature, mm -hmm. providence, but they even say you know the word. Uh, theos for them is uh, is interchangeable and nature you know phusis they're all interchangeable because they all mean right. the same thing right i was thinking about this a bit and um it's interesting when people talk about the divine because what does the divine really mean and if you go back and look at uh the pre indo-european roots of uh the word divine for example the word divine is uh, related to uh, Deus, mm -hmm. God in Latin, I believe. And then also Zeus, they all come from the same uh, root. And what that root means is uh, something that is shining. And so I think that when people say the word divine, what are they saying? I think that, I think they're saying that there's something beautiful and resplendent about nature, the universe, galaxies, living organisms, and things like mm -hmm. that. So there's almost 
a very deep aesthetic response. And so when people says, when, when someone says something is divine, you know, like she's divinely beautiful or right. something like that, that there's a special aura around it, which is radiant. And the reason it's so radiant and beautiful is that it does reflect an order, a coherent order. And that's what gives rise to beauty. So, you know, there's this ancient idea that goodness, truth, and beauty go together and that they're interconnected and that they embody some kind of radiance that's manifest in the world. Yeah, and I think personally, I think that that, that aesthetic is what ha was um, thrown out the baby with the bathwater with what we would call modern science with again reductive materialism we we lost that and you know a, a number of authors including you know Charles Taylor traces the the history of that in his book Secular Age you know Roger Scruton talks about that lots of people talk about the fact that we we now live in a in an age when all beauty is lost because we've reduced everything down to chance combinations of atoms and We've we've lost right. our connection with, with right. nature, and I and I also think that's one of the driving right. forces behind what we're seeing in science now, which is uh, the idea of uh, panpsychism. There are more and more thinkers that are mm -hmm. looking at panpsychism and saying, "Yeah, it, you know, maybe consciousness really is a a fundamental property of the universe, and and not a byproduct of uh, of neurons firing." Uh, Right. I don't have any problem with atheists, but the problem that I have with some people who are, are atheists are, is, is their reductionism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the reductionism that bothers me. I mean, if someone says, you know, I don't believe in God, I can handle that. But when I see people who picture the world in a reductionistic sense, that bothers me. Uh, because based on my experience, as you... Uh, mature intellectually as a human being and as you grow philosophically the, the world should become more and more awe-inspiring mm -hmm. and multi-dimensional rather than flat and two-dimensional so that's the thing that really uh, worries me uh, about uh, reductionism and i think you can find that reductionism in theists too because yep. instead of just saying everything is um uh, you know, some kind of uh, emergence, you know, from atoms colliding or, you know, some, some kind of emergent phenomenon from matter or something like that, or, or that life is a disease of matter, which is what one physicist said, what beautiful image. <laughs> but uh, theists can be <laughs> equally reductionistic because they say, well, you know, God made everything. Right. And uh, both of those, both of those alternatives, take a lot of the mystery out of the universe, because the, the theist is saying, "Well, it's just God." You know, there's your answer. You don't need to think about it anymore. The materialists say, "Well, it's just matter. You don't need to think about it anymore." That's why I like uh, pantheism, because it suggests that there is something divine or radiant about the universe. Mm -hmm. There's something radiant about life. Uh, you know, which we could describe as divine, which is like, a, it's a kind of like a aesthetic superlative term, but it doesn't reduce the mystery of it. And so in that sense, I find, I find that to be non-reductionistic and that, that appeals to me aesthetically as a human being. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, <laughs> pantheism or, or pandeism are, is, is as close as you can get mm -hmm. to the Stoic conception of God. You know, I say this, this the Stoic God, and I know you don't like that term, but the Stoic God doesn't fit in any <laughs> in any box. You know, no matter what definition, modern definition we try to apply to it, it doesn't fit perfectly. But pandeism and right. pantheism I mean, are close. May, maybe that was their intention, actually. Maybe what maybe that's why they have this whole argued that, group yeah. of terms that they're throwing out because because they are saying actually Seneca says this. You can call God this. You can call God nature. You can call it logos. You can call it fate. And you know what? They're all correct. Correct. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what, I mean, what is uh, you know Cleanthes famous hymn? The opening lines, you know, the God of many names, right? So that goes that goes right. all the way back to to Cleanthes. 
let's let's move on. I think we've uh, beat that topic to death. Um, chapter eight, uh, you wrote about, uh, and and I, I love the topic. I just recently did a, a re um, broadcast on my podcast, mm -hmm. but uh, Stoics. Uh, Seneca's famous, you know, battle, he called it battle with fortuna, but battle with fortune. And uh, what is fortune to Seneca? And you know, how do you think that moderns can apply his lesson um, about you know, what fortune gives us and uh, that is not, that, that what fortune gives us is not our own? How do, how do moderns adapt that? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> he uses this phrase, uh, which Epictetus uses as well, that everything that is given to us um, by fortune is on loan to us from the mm -hmm. universe. And I just think that's an incredible metaphor because um, I really tried to get into that and explore that more deeply in the book than I think maybe anyone else has tried to <laughs> uh, explore it before. And what I what I came to realize is that um, if you do a really close reading of the Stoics on this, what they're saying is that, sure, everything that we have, uh, say we have good health, a beautiful family, maybe we have some wealth, well, that's given to us by fortune. So we don't really own that. It's on loan to us from the universe. And someday we will have to give that back. We'll have to return that to the universe. So it's not permanent. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't appreciate it. And so you have to have sort of like some thought of, you know, detachment in your mind that it's not permanent, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't appreciate it, you know, while you have it or while it's on loan mm -hmm. to you. And mm -hmm. um, I just find that to be a very satisfying idea because we do live in an impermanent world, but just because the world is impermanent doesn't mean that we should uh, treasure the gifts that we have, even if they're on loan to us. Yeah, and, and I think in particular in moderns, we are so attached to our things, right? The things that we, we right. quote, own, <laughs> uh, possess, whatever the case might be. And this is a valuable lesson for, for us from Seneca uh, that everything, yeah, as you say, is, is on loan to us from from the cosmos and we may have it for a long time and we may have it for a short time and as the stoics argue that includes your life you know your life is also on on loan and, exactly. and you have no idea how exactly. long that's going to last now uh chapter nine i think we've covered this but i'm gonna see if you have anything to add uh and and i i want to mention its title because this is i think uh a really if if, if you buy the book for no other reason buy it for chapter nine uh, the title is uh, on vicious well it's on vicious crowds and the ties that bind, and you deal with the concepts of uh, herb a herb <coughs> herd mentality and mob mentality, and as you've already pointed out, that's something that Seneca was way ahead of his times in in uh, explaining, but particularly pertinent in today's society, and the the thing that I'm wondering um, is. Do do modern do you think modern technologies such as smartphones and instant media in our hands, do they make this phenomenon of a herd mentality or mob mentality uh, more widespread, or do they allow it to develop more spontaneously in modern times than than even in uh, than in the times that that Seneca was writing about this? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about that, and part of it has to do with the fact. That it has to do with the invention of the internet because before, because what the internet did basically was it uh, destroyed serious print journalism. Mm. And so everything not, now is gauged toward to getting clicks and shares. I mean, uh, I suffer from that pathology as well. If I post something like in a stoic group on Facebook and so, and it gets like 500 likes and it's like, wow, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not very virtuous. I'm afraid, but <clears throat> But I'm like Seneca, I'm not perfect either. But in any case, it's true. Uh, the, the internet does accelerate this. There's a very good book called uh, Virality by a British scholar called Tony D. Sampson, which is how um, the internet encourages the viral uh, transmission of uh, emotional contagions. So, so when you're exposed to a big group of people and they've all made a judgment about something, and they're outraged about it. Well, it's very easy to feel 
outrage too and to make that same judgment. But um, what I would say is that you have to take a step back. If you feel that happening to you, you have to take a step back because uh, we've seen so many cases of things that have appeared on the internet that have not been true right. or they've been misinterpretations. And sometimes to find out takes even like days or weeks or months because you have to allow for due process. So I think that uh, that's one area where the internet has had a very negative impact on people. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and you're correct. People make instantaneous judgments based upon opinion and don't want to wait for the facts. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think uh, a lot of politicians, no matter which side of the aisle they happen to be on, and I'm speaking aisles here in, in American politics, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're on the left or on the right, they use this as a, as a divisive weapon to you know get my side against the other right. side. And it, it Absolutely. just perpetuates the problem. Now, you uh, later in that same chapter, I think you do a good job of uh, pointing out the contribution that the Stoics made to human rights. And would you like to share some of that? Right. Well, basically, um, the Stoics were the first philosophical uh, school in Western history to hold that all human beings were equal because they all share the spark of reason. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will develop reason in the same way, but it's like everyone is, you know, given muscles. And if you exercise your muscles, then you'll develop your strength. It's the same thing with reason, but they maintain that everyone had a spark of reason. And because of that, we were all part of a common humanity, a common brotherhood and sisterhood. They, they also said that women were equal w with, with men and, uh, you know, s slaves, that everyone possessed the, the spark of reason, you know, and uh, people from different ethnic groups. So this is really the idea of a universal human community. And over the centuries, um, this idea, which was part of uh, what was known as natural law, continued to evolve. And by the time that you get to the Enlightenment, uh, for example, like John Locke and other Enlightenment philosophers were totally uh, aware of these Stoic views. And they, they used these Stoic views as a way f for arguing for human rights or natural rights. Now, this actually goes back to the ancient world. It wasn't just something that came to fruition in the enlightenment but there's like this long unfolding history and eventually it did contribute to the modern idea of human rights it contributed to the elimination of slavery the only problem is that it took so mm -hmm. long it's like martin luther king said the arc of the moral universe uh is long but it bends towards justice right right yeah it Took way too long. But the seeds of many of those ideas can be traced directly back to the Stoics. And these later thinkers who developed them further were fully aware of these Stoic ideas. They read Seneca, they read Cicero, and they were carrying on and developing that tradition. Yeah, and I think that's something that uh, Stoics don't get enough credit for. Con yeah. yeah, it's very strange that no one actually mentions that in modern popular books on Stoicism. You have to do um, a fairly deep dive into, uh, you know, like academics or scholarly literature to uncover that. But uh, there have been a few people. It's just the, the fact that it's connecting those dots over such a long period of time. But if you do intellectual history, you can actually see how, you know, these people responsible for the development of modern human rights and the elimination of slavery were aware of these stoic ideas and they were drawing on them. Yeah, I, I wonder how much when when authors, even if they realize that there's a connection that goes all the way back, back to the stoics, are hesitant to present that because they realize they have to overcome the idea that, you know, stoics are the stiff upper lip, I don't care about anything, you know, suck it up, buttercup people. How, how can they be the ones that develop this idea of, 
of oikiosis and, and an expanding uh, circle of concern for uh, everyone to include all of humanity in the cosmos itself. Those are appear to be two uh, counter arguments or two, two you know, yeah, well, self-contradictory. As, as I noted in the book, people have overlooked the importance of like love and uh, gratitude yes. in Stoicism. And those are two extremely important principles for the Stoics. And I'm going to get to that here real, real soon. Um, chapter 10, you compare and contrast Epicureans and Stoics. Seneca provides a, uh, a source for that. I think a, a, a real good source for that discussion because he was oftentimes willing to look for, as you point out, wisdom wherever it, it may happen to, he may happen to find it. And in his case, he found a tremendous amount of wisdom in the writings of Epicurus and frequently quotes them more so in the early letters than in the, his latter uh, letters to uh, Lucilius, but he does quote him frequently. And um, the, the problem that sometimes I think occurs with modern Stoicism is that because of this, Seneca is viewed as an eclectic or is viewed as um, having departed from Stoicism. And one of the one of his letters, and I don't believe you make reference to letter 33 in, in your book, but it's one that is often used where Seneca wrote, how about it then? Will I not walk in the footsteps of my predecessors? I will indeed use the ancient road, but if I find another route that is more direct and has fewer ups and downs, I will stake it out. I will stake out that one. Those who advance these doctrines before us are not our masters, but our guides. The truth lies open to all and uh has not been uh, taken over much is left for those to learn to come. Anyway, uh, some people take that to mean, well, I can just pick and choose from stoicism and create whatever I want because Seneca said I could do that. And I, since you've spent so much time with Seneca, I'm wondering, uh, did you find any indication that Seneca disagreed with or disputed what would be considered a fundamental doctrine of stoicism not not details but one of the fundamental mm -hmm. doctrines of stoicism um <clears throat> not really uh actually i do have that quote in the book it's uh, in the chapter on how to live with authenticity and i use that to illustrate uh seneca's open-mindedness okay uh his intellectual open-mindedness which makes him seem like a totally modern person and i think that's a very good quality but um I mean, he did he did have some criticisms of the earlier Stoics. Yes. He thought that Chrysippus was too, you know, much of a logic chopper in mm -hmm. some ways, and that some of Zeno's arguments weren't entirely convincing. But but all in all, he did not de depart from Stoic ideas in any significant way. He was more, I think, he was more thinking about the evolution of uh, science than philosophy because he was talking. Uh, in another quote about how, uh, you know, even if we have, you know, uh, you know, endless centuries, it's not enough time to study astronomy and the people who live in the future will look back at us and, and they'll, they'll find it strange that we didn't know more about the physical universe. But in terms of stoicism, he didn't depart from any fund fundamental doctrine of stoicism. Now, there's one fundamental doctrine of Stoicism that I do depart from, though. And I mentioned that in chapter one, which is um, the idea that virtue is all or nothing. It's an all or nothing uh, state. And I just don't find that to be critical. So, so, so credible. So people who study virtue ethics today, uh, no one would really go along with that idea. I, I think that the whole idea of becoming... Um, making progress in Stoicism is becoming more and more virtuous. But if you interpreted the Stoic doctrine literally, you could only be perfectly virtuous or unvirtuous. And I think that there's some kind of uh, logical fallacy involved with that. Yeah, and I, uh, while I don't disagree with the doctrine, I think that it sometimes gets um, overplayed. And, and I think you know what we see in Epictetus, he makes it clear that progress toward the goal is progress. In other words, you know, we are, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is true, uh, and to use the stoic analogy, if I'm several inches under the water or if I'm several leagues um, under the water, I'm still drowning. But if I'm several inches, I'm a lot closer 
to safety. Now, does that make me any less drowning? No, I'm still drowning. Uh, but uh, I'm in a different, it's, you can't argue that I'm not in a, a better state. I'm closer to, to safety or I'm closer to virtue. And so one of the things that I've emphasized in my uh, podcast, because I think that that concept, as you point out, can be a real wet blanket for people in their practice. But mm -hmm. I point out, you know, that's an ideal, the, the ideal of the sage, you know, if you translate it into, you know, Christian lingo, it's, you know, how many people are going to truly become Christ-like? Well, they're not, but Christians mm -hmm. understand that's an ideal that I'm aiming toward. And I think for the Stoics, you, we look at the sage and we look at virtue and we say, okay, yeah, I'm probably not going to make it in this lifetime. I'm not going to be a sage. I'm <laughs> not going to be uh, totally virtuous, but I can act more appropriately day in and day out, and I can make progress mm -hmm. toward that goal. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, I think mm -hmm. to keep, you know, I, I say, keep your eye on the goal and keep glancing up, but the real attention needs to be on the path directly in front of you. Because if you, uh -huh. if you spend all of your mm -hmm. time discouraged by how far you are from the goal, you know, I used to be a mountain climber. And the worst thing you can do is stare up at the summit, you know, because you realize, man, I am never, I'm never going to make it. And so you just, you, you keep your, you keep your head down and you look at the path in front of you and you look up every once in a while, make sure you're heading in the right direction. But if you stare at that summit, you're just going to get discouraged. And yeah, I, I understand your point. Yes. Uh, so uh, yes. it's much appreciated. I think it's a, it's a difference in language actually, because you're saying, uh, I'm saying that you can become more virtuous and you're saying that you can become closer to it. Yes. Yeah, that is that is the difference. And I think that the Stoics would argue that you're not becoming more virtuous, uh, but you're becoming closer to becoming a virtuous uh person, which is the which is the sage. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it is it is all or nothing. And I don't know whether the people like Epictetus and Seneca, I think both tried to soften that language. And I'm not sure if it's because yeah, they yes. They, you know, they don't specifically say that they think it's wrong, but I think I think what happens is the way it was stated in the early Stoa is mm. so easily misunderstood. Yeah. It's, it's, it's harsh. The early, the early Stoics had a lot of very harsh dichotomies. Yes. Yeah. Actually, and, and this is one of them. Yeah. So how modern Stoics would you know deal with that is an interesting question. Yeah. No, it is, and I and I think it's a, an appropriate point to make, which is why I've. Yeah. spoken on the topic several yeah. times uh, yeah I, I i felt virtuous by the fact that i questioned a significant stoic idea in the first chapter of the book because it showed at least that i was thinking about it in an open-minded way <laughs> so. yeah you were you were practicing what uh what seneca did you know you're you're challenging exactly. it. <laughs> right. but other uh, but aside from that really um i i find that i really have uh very few disagreements with Stoic ideas. I mean, they, they all seem to embody common sense. I mean, Stoicism really, it's based on having a sense of reality in, in a sense, so that you know your judgments are based on reality rather than things that you're imagining. And Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think that uh, yeah, the, the point of even bringing this up is that I have, and I've said it numerous times, I don't have any problems with people modifying, uh, resynthesizing stoicism um, as long as they're clear about you know what they're doing. And that was the point, I think. I, but I think people make a big mistake when they try to argue, well, Seneca did this. No, Seneca didn't do that. Seneca thought, Seneca did not divert from the stoic path in, in any fundamental way. You know, right. he, he was, he was Correct. a true stoic, uh, to the end. And, you know, I, in a recent, uh, conversation, yeah, I use the analogy of if we're all standing at the base of Mount Eudaimonia and we're all looking up there at that summit and we see <laughs> several signs. And over here we see, you know, the Epicureans with a sign in the ground that says, here is the path. And, and they've got a, you know, luxurious uh, four wheel drive that everybody's going to get in and go up in the mountain. And on the opposite extreme over here, we see the cynics and, you know, they're all barefoot with nothing but a staff and a little tiny backpack. And, yes. and, you know, and uh, in between there, we see, you know, the Stoics and, and, uh, you know, they've got a, they've got a backpack and, and, you know, and, uh, and at least they have hiking boots on and, uh, 
you know, maybe the, uh, the, the Aristotelians are saying, yeah, they've got the same thing, but they've got some pack mules to bring along some goods with them up the mountain. All of that is fine. And those are, those are predefined paths that the, ancients, that the ancients marked for us, labeled for us and said, this is our path. So when a modern comes along and says, well, I want to create a new path. Good for you. You have that right. Yeah, but mm -hmm. put a different label on it. Make it clear. You know, don't walk over to the stoic path and say, scratch out stoic and say, you know, we're going to, this is, this is the new stoic path over here. Leave the old path the way it was. Right. Make it clear that if you're doing something new, and that's what I appreciated about Lawrence Becker. Lawrence Becker set out mm -hmm. to completely resynthesize uh, stoicism, but but he said he it, said it he right up front. I don't like this. Yeah. I think this is untenable. I'm going to create something new, and he called it a new stoicism. But that was that was the point I'm trying to make. I just think Seneca gets <laughs> Seneca gets abused. Letter thirty three gets abused that way. Now. Uh, Chapter right. thirteen right. covers the uh, the topic of gratitude. And again, in my opinion, this is a topic that is, I think, overlooked sometimes in modern times. And I think it's because we people mistakenly sometimes see this as some sort of uh, religious reverence toward a transcendent God, rather than a uh, what I would call a deeply felt gratitude toward uh, an imminent. And I'm going to use that that word divinity uh, that permeates all of nature, but or an imminent you know rationality. Uh, what message are you attempting to convey with this uh, chapter on love and gratitude? Um, it's very interesting because the three main Roman Stoics, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus, really stressed the role of gratitude uh, quite a lot. And uh, one of the things that I found to be amazing, uh, which I'm not sure that anyone else has noticed because of the way I researched this book, I created a database of what everyone said about everything with like 2000 quotations. Hmm. So I could like call them all up. So I was able to discover some things that other people may have overlooked. And one of the things that I found just to be amazing is that Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, they all say that when you're on your deathbed, you should be grateful for the life the universe has given yes. you. They all say hmm. that. And I think that's just an amazing way of looking at the world. And I think that um, this goes back to this sort of the, this idea that there's a natural radiance of being and that nature itself is inherently generous and that our lives are a gift from the universe, which is what all of the Stoics thought. And um, uh, I think that having that state of gratitude in mind when you're on your deathbed would be an indication that you had lived the best possible life. Because what would the worst possible situation be? It would be a sense of regret that, oh, you know, I had all these opportunities and I didn't pursue them. And uh, my life uh, amounted, you know, to nothing. Whereas Epictetus said, when you're on your deathbed, I, I want to be uh, thinking of life as a festival. And I want to be grateful for the fact that I was able to contemplate the deep order and beauty of nature. And let me be uh, thinking and writing these thoughts when I die. That seems to me like a uh, human, a, a, a real human life worth living. Yeah. And you hit on something that I know both, both Epictetus and Seneca do, and that, that idea of contemplating nature and both of them, as a matter of fact, at, well, even Marcus makes the same statement that life is worth living because we have this ability to contemplate nature to a large extent. And that is a, a, um, a valuable uh, uh, I would say source of um, happiness or a source of, um, source of wisdom for the Stoics is to contemplate nature. And they saw a tremendous value in it. Right. And that was true for a lot of Greek philosophers too, like Plato and Aristotle, that... Uh, you know, they also believed, like the Stoics, that human beings were rational beings that participated in the rationality of the cosmos. You find that idea in Plato. 
And this was a great inspiration to ancient scientists as well, like Ptolemy, that we could contemplate the order of nature and understand it in some way. And, and in some way, that contemplation um, is a fulfillment of human nature. Now, you also deal with the topic of topics of uh, joy and, and love in that chapter. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, actually, it's in your final chapter where you're talking about topics of freedom, tranquility, and lasting joy. Um, each of those words, concepts, have specific mm -hmm. meaning in Stoicism. And yet I think each of them probably differs to some extent from the way people would commonly consider those words. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, at, from Seneca's perspective, what do the Stoics mean by freedom, tranquility, and joy? Mm. Well, for the Stoics, um, the goal was to become a virtuous person. But one of the side effects of being virtuous is that you would experience eudaimonia, which is usually translated as happiness but it's probably better translated as like a deep sense of well-being. And it's very interesting that in the thought of uh, Seneca, now Epictetus doesn't really talk about stoic joy. That was like one of the positive emotions for the Stoics, but he does talk about how freedom, Epictetus like Seneca talks about how freedom and tranquility go together. And so this end goal of um, eudaimonia, which is, you know, very closely related to the idea of becoming virtuous, uh, the, all of these ideas, they really go together. And f freedom means that you're not enslaved to any negative false judgments that would give rise to negative emotions. So basically... You, you're, you're, when, when you're free of those false judgments, uh, your soul is in a state of uh, tranquility. And when you have judgments that are uh, in harmony with reason, and you're not you're not troubled by these uh, you know violent emotional states, it, it leads to a state of you know, happiness or joy. So this is really the end of uh, Stoicism in a sense. I mean, people often say that eudaimonia, you know, was the goal that all ancient philosophical schools were aiming for. Of course, the Stoics always put in that footnote, we really want a good character. And once you develop the good character, then you have eudaimonia as well. But they're very closely interrelated. Yes. So I don't think there's any harm in uh, referring to that as being uh, at least, if, if not the end goal of Stoicism, at least a final destination, like on top of that mountain that you were talking about, the paths going up the mm -hmm. mountain. And Seneca uses that analogy too, because the way that you would reach a state like this is that you've actually risen above the realm of fortune and you're looking down upon it right. from above so that fortune and chance, they're still operating in the universe, but you've basically risen above them. So you're no longer subject to suffering from those, uh, you know, chance events. Yeah. Which is why ironically Epictetus yeah. could make the argument that you could be free and could achieve eudaimonia while being a slave. And Seneca could argue the same right. while you're being exiled and, and both experienced those things. Right. Right. That um, sometimes people face very difficult circumstances, but that doesn't mean that um, they constrain you in internally. So it's possible to be free in an inner sense. Yeah. In a, in a true sense. Of course, it's better to have advantages that allow you to <clears throat> live in better circumstances. Yeah. But still, uh, the thing about Stoicism is that it was very egalitarian, whereas Aristotle said that you needed external goods like wealth and good looks and things like that to be happy. 
the Stoics said that happiness comes from within and that virtue is the virtue is the only good. And that was a critique of the Aristotelian view, I believe, because, for example, let's say that this is a uh, an analogy that I used in the book. Let's say that you've led a good virtuous life and finally you reach old age and you've been robbed of your health, you've been robbed of your wealth, and you have nothing external, you have no family members, you're just alone. Does that mean just because you've lost those things, you've lost those so-called external goods, that you're no longer a virtuous person? Of course right. not. It doesn't mean that at all. And, and that's that's what the Stoic critique of Aristotle yes. was. And what you find in this is that Stoicism was incredibly egalitarian because it said that anyone could make progress on the path of philosophy, regardless of whatever you know external goods they had. Yeah, and I think it's also important to point out that the Stoics, you know, were not ascetics, and so they were not opposed to no. having. If you had wealth, well, good for you. But just recognize that wealth is neither good nor bad. It's an indifferent. But how you use it is is either good or bad. Um, so they weren't opposed to anyone having those things. They just said our happiness doesn't depend on them. Um, yeah, and they often come and go. It's yeah. like the wheel of fortune it takes you up and takes you down. And yes. uh, sometimes uh, you might be in a good space with, uh, you know, so-called external goods or advantages. That's the way that I translated uh, preferred indifference, advantages, just because I think that's much easier for an average reader to understand advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. But they come and yeah. go. And, and regardless of whether you have advantages or you're disadvantaged, you can still pursue virtue. You can still study philosophy. You can still contribute to the world and make the world a, a better place. Sometimes if someone is in a very bad position, one of the things that they can do to uh, increase their sense of well-being is reach out to others and try to help other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. The word, uh, the word indifferent is or indifference is easily misunderstood because it's often translated into, well, then we should be indifferent toward those things. And that's not what they're saying. My, my wife is, is truly an indifferent, meaning my, uh, my well-being and my, it doesn't depend upon my wife. But if I, I, she's not, uh, She's not an indifferent to me, meaning that I'm not indifferent toward her. I don't, you know, all of those. My job, if I was indifferent toward my job, I would lose my job. But my job doesn't bring me any, you know, uh, progress in my moral development unless I attempt to do so. It doesn't automatically bring that yeah. to me. So the idea that something is a moral indifferent to us doesn't mean that we are indifferent to it. Um, and again, this. Exactly. Which goes back to the exactly. previous discussion about the difference between Stoics and Epicureans. The Epicureans were literally indifferent to the polis. You know, they removed themselves from political life, and the Stoics did the exact opposite. They would have looked at, well, it doesn't. It, the the polis is uh, is an indifferent in the sense that it doesn't matter what political structure may be there. I can still behave morally in it, uh, but. Uh, it's not an indifferent, and I'm not going to be indifferent toward it. I'm going to participate in it. And that's a key distinction between the Stoics and the Epicureans. I will uh, give you the last opportunity to say if there's anything that you think that uh, is important that your book has covered that we didn't you know, cover in this discussion that you would like you know, the listeners and potential readers to know about your book. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, now that I spent 14 months working on the book, and now that it's out, I'm looking back at it. And one of the things that I see about it is that I think that if anyone is interested in Stoicism, it's actually, now that I have some distance from it, I can look at it. I think it's a good introduction to Stoicism in general because it covers most of the basic concepts that anyone would be interested in. And I think that actually if someone read this book, they would be quite well equipped to actually read all of the original writings of Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. And I think they'd be able to make sense out of them. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I I think it is, uh, you know, typically when we talk about a an introduction to Stoicism, it's oftentimes approached from a theoretical perspective. And you know, your book, uh, while I can see that it was not intended to be an introduction as a as a side effect of that, uh, of studying uh, Seneca's life. And you, if you read it, you're going to get that as you go because you you, you basically mm-hmm. have to, to present, Sto- to present Seneca the way that he is being presented, you have to introduce the concepts and you have to introduce some of the theory. Right. So um, I think your book is an, is an ideal combination for somebody who says, yeah, this Seneca seems like a, a, an interesting character, mm-hmm. which he is for a variety of mm-hmm. reasons. And, and I would argue uh, probably more so, you know, we can relate to Marcus in some ways, but let's face it, he was an emperor of Rome. So it's really much more difficult to relate to him on a one-on-one-to-one basis. Epictetus, you know, Epictetus was a slave and Epictetus, uh, sometimes his teachings come across as uh, very harsh. So mm-hmm. I think Seneca provides a great segue, an entry point for people to read about a particular person and how Stoicism influenced their life. And your book does a great job of introducing that Stoic life as it, that Seneca lived. And in the course of doing that, it uh, presents just enough doctrine, uh, just enough theory, so that you, you know, you're kind of slipping it in there without people getting bored with it, which I think is, which is good. Right. And I was really astonished to see how close the thought of Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus, you know, actually is on, uh, you know, all, all the important issues. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think it's, you know, because of that, I think it makes basically any of the other Roman Stoics approachable. So, yeah, it does. It's just different styles. You know, you have one writing in their diary. Different styles. You have, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, Epictetus is very, can be very protreptic at times. You know, I sometimes think, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd have the courage to go into one of his lectures, but you know, because <laughs> you know, you know, you're going to get be screaming. You're going to get both barrels. Um, whereas uh, Seneca, I think, comes across as, and you've expressed it well, comes across as the friend that you would sit down with and have a conversation about Stoicism yes. with. He's, yes. He doesn't. He's not a teacher, uh, in in the sense of you know uh, Epictetus in that in that uh, vein, and he's not writing right. a a diary. He's not lecturing anyone, but he's a very humane yeah. writer. And uh, it's a, a moving experience to be in the presence of someone who has uh, that kind of humane feeling for the rest of the human race. Well, I enjoyed the book. I definitely recommend the book to anybody. And um, I thank you for taking the time to be with me here on the podcast today and look forward to to further discussions with you, David, and wish you well. Okay, that sounds great. It's been wonderful speaking with you.